Well, greetings and welcome to The Dividing Line on a Tuesday, back in the saddle for this week anyways. Uh, only for this week. We'll be gone again uh, next week, and then um, Sanity uh, returns, and we'll be here for uh, most of August. I'm not sure if it's sane, actually, to be in Phoenix during August, but anyway, that's where we will we will be have a lot to get to today we'll definitely be going past our normal time uh, probably looking at at least a jumbo edition if not more we have a lot to get to but i'm not sure how much i'll be able to remember to get to actually since i didn't write it all down wanted to begin the program today as i have announced on facebook before i get to that i'm well aware of the uh, of the uh, trending news today concerning the uh, undercover video of the uh, Planned Parenthood um, official. I just saw Planned Parenthood's response, their written response. I just read that. And I tweeted out to them having read it, uh, Dear Planned Parenthood, uh, Goebbels just called. He wants his propaganda back. <laughs> um, what do you expect? Uh, if you know anything about the history of Planned Parenthood, if you know anything about its founder, uh, to find one of their officials um, sipping wine and eating a, a Caesar salad over discussing sales of body parts is not overly uh, shocking, to be honest with you. Uh, I mean, it's absolutely disgusting, but Planned Parenthood has always been absolutely disgusting. So um, if it'll help in getting them defunded, uh, if it'll help, uh, you know, but I'm not sure how long the attention span of most uh, American uh, voters is today. And uh, so I don't know. I don't know. Maybe if we get a, a, a you know, a, a comedian to do something about it, then, you know, the younger generation would listen. But but uh, I'm not going to be talking about that today. Everyone has uh, seen the video and it is truly, well, almost everyone has seen the video. I won't mention anybody who hasn't actually seen the video, but there are people uh, who actually have not seen the video yet, which is just amazing. But anyway, uh, have things to get to. And uh, over the weekend, I believe it came out on the 10th, um, someone sent me a tweet with a link uh, to a... Well, I don't even know where this was. It was at... It was at Google, but Google's everywhere now. I mean, uh, Google is uh, Skynet. Uh, we just got the name wrong. Who would ever thought that Google would nuke all of humanity? But um, this was a Google video. So at some kind of... And for some reason, Google hasn't called me uh, to talk about stuff. Uh, for I, I, don't, I don't understand why. I mean, they, they certainly know where I am probably pretty much at all times. And... Um, but this was at a um, Google get-together, and Matthew Vines, of course, was invited to be special guest because Matthew Vines is special. And um, everyone like Matthew Vines is now special uh, because the Supreme Court said so. At least that's how people are thinking. And I don't even know when it was recorded, to be perfectly honest with you. It seems to be rather recent. Um, but it does strike me that there is... A, a very discernible shift in the behavior, speech, attitude uh, of the leaders of the home movement represented by how uh, Divine spoke in this particular situation where he was asked a question by an audience member about whether he would debate me. Now, uh, we have placed the transcript of his comments on Facebook, so you can follow along there. But if you haven't seen it, we will listen to it first in its entire context. And then we will go back through it and respond point by point to what Mr. Vines is saying. Now, I would address Matthew directly, but it's pretty obvious to me that uh, he's now uh, beyond um, well, as he says, going in the gutter with someone like me. And 
it would be helpful, it would have been helpful, if before watching this response, you actually had the time uh, to listen through the response that he's referring to in his comments, which was my four-hour response to his one-hour presentation, hence it was five hours long in total, um, which, interestingly enough, when I first posted it, Matthew Vine's response was, well, we will debate once my book comes out, and I will respond in my book. There was nothing initially about, oh, I... I, that, I'm just not going to waste my time. I'm not going to roll in the gutter with people like you. You're just so over the top. You're so nasty. That was, that's not what it was back then. But now that he has become the media darling, uh, now that he gets all the same softball questions thrown at him that they do on CNN and things like that, uh, he seems to be believing his own press now. And so objections that he never voiced before his book came out. Never voiced before his book came out. Now all of a sudden, I'm just terrible, horrible, and nasty, and mean, and unloving, and all the rest of this stuff, and all I do is say that uh, homosexuals are, are like people who want to have sex with dogs. That's what he says. Now, by the way, we, um, I want to thank the folks in our chat channel because I... Um, uh, just yesterday, uh, while traveling, asked if folks there would take the time to listen once again to everything that I said in that very lengthy response. And a couple folks took the time to do so. And I asked, uh, what did I say about dogs in that? And uh, the, the fact of the matter is, I, I didn't say anything about dogs. I, uh, there are a couple times bestiality did come up because um, that's in Leviticus 18. Sort of hard to avoid that. Uh, I once did say something about uh, I might want to start a family with my German Shepherd, but that doesn't that's not going to work um, because of the species issue. Uh, but anyone who's actually listened to what I said knows that how Matthew Vines is going to represent it here demonstrates that he does not believe that his audience will ever check out what he says. There's, there's been a change um, in Vines' thinking. And he's come to realize that he can say pretty much anything he wants. And his fans will believe whatever he says. And they're not going to check him out. They're not going to go and, and say, I, I wonder if what he's saying is accurate. So what he's chosen to do in this response, aside from being just, you know, if, if you reversed the roles here, and I said about Matthew Vines, what he said about me, I'm not going to respond to Matthew Vines because I'm not going to I'm not going to roll in the gutter with someone like him. I'd never hear the end of it. I mean, it would just be it, 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 oh, you, you're just so horrible and unloving. But he can say that because he's a homosexual, and homosexuals can say anything homosexuals want to say. They're the persecuted minority. So they can be mean and nasty and they can be deceptive and, and, and the whole nine yards and misrepresent everybody. I mean, I can guarantee you he's never played my response for his audiences and gone through it. I played everything he said and responded to every word he said in his presentation. Yeah, that, that's, that's because we approach this as an issue of truth, as an issue of life, desirous that people would know the truth, that they would escape the clutches of death. That's not Matthew Vines' motivation because Matthew Vines is not a Christian. He claims to be one, but he's a false teacher. And his motivations come out very clearly here. When a Christian, when a person who claims to be a Christian has to grossly misrepresent the people that they are disagreeing with, well, we're supposed to be followers of him who is the truth. And so Matthew Vines knows that he could never survive a debate against any knowledgeable opponent. He's a 25-year-old college dropout who is borrowing all of his arguments from other people, mainly from James Brownson, but, but others. He's, he's, you know, I mean, when he first did his first video, 
Brownson hadn't published yet. So there's differences now. You know, so he's updated stuff, but he's borrowing from everybody else. He's, he doesn't have the ability to do original work. He's getting this from all these other places. And so he knows he can never survive that debate. And so he has to find a way to excuse making the claims he does, just like David Gushy, making the claims that he does without actually then having to back it up. So he's asked about why he won't debate. And like I said, if you if you've listened and we have it around the main main web page, right at AOMin.org, get it while you can. Um, download the review, listen to it, and then listen to his representation and go, wow, there's a big disconnect there. And it's called dishonesty. But think about what is now allowing him to do what he couldn't do just a few years ago. And I suggest to you, the difference is what has happened just over the past few months, and especially in regards to um, now the interactions that have been had with him in regards to the Supreme Court decision. So let's uh, let's take a listen to what uh, uh, what was said. Here uh, here we go. And uh, yeah, that's that's really great. Um, in terms of furthering that dialogue. Uh, James White has offered to debate with you several times. I was curious what the reasons are that that uh, hasn't happened. Yeah, so when I posted my initial talk three years ago, there was a Southern Baptist minister in Phoenix who recorded a four-hour rebuttal, podcast rebuttal, to my talk. And, well, so here's what I would say. I, when I'm thinking about Christians who disagree with me on this topic, they lie along a spectrum. Or rather, Christians who don't vocally agree with me on this topic, they lie along a spectrum. You have a minority of people who are, are silent sympathizers, who may not fully agree with me, who may, may not, but those are the people who really, if you reach them with these arguments, it's like you've liberated them. And, and they finally like feel free to express their beliefs, and they can become really passionate advocates. Then there are a lot of people in the middle, I'd say the majority of people in the middle, who passively hold negative beliefs, what I would call non-affirming beliefs about same-sex relationships, um, and who truly believe those things but don't think about it a ton, would never write a letter to the editor about it, would never call up a radio show about it. That's where my dad was. Then you have a substantial minority of people who I would say are deeply entrenched and passionate about their opposition. Uh, and those people tend to be the most established people in any given church community, especially the more conservative churches they tend to make institutional change very difficult because they will threaten to pull their financial giving from a church if it shifts at all on the topic. And so what I'm trying to do, and it, they also give the impression to a lot of people that everyone in the community not only shares their belief, but also shares that passion with which they hold their belief because no one else is actually saying anything. So they kind of have the megaphone. When I'm engaging people on this topic, I am most interested in engaging the people who are the silent sympathizers and the people in the middle. Because most people who are in that place of entrenched passion opposition cannot be reached um, right now. I don't ever, I try never to write people off entirely, but I do postpone people. And I will postpone engagement with some people because the way that they think and talk about these topics is so unhelpful and so devoid of any kind of relational, um, care or understanding that I don't, that that's not really worth my energy. So James White, I mean, he compared being gay to wanting to have sex with dogs and things that are so absurd and so offensive. And he was so passionate about it and saw no reason, you know, talked about comparisons to pedophilia and said that only, you know, 1% of gay people actually want monogamy. I don't know where he got that statistic. And, like, and, and there, I mean, it was, it was a highly vitriolic four hours. And honestly, that's not worth my time. Because there are so many people who are worth my time and who are thoughtful and kind. And there are some people who are truly vitriolic and who are not kind, are not compassionate. And I am not, like, my time is worth so much more than, like, wasting it, going down into a gutter with people who want to compare me to, like, people who want to have sex with dogs. 
So that's the reason why I haven't engaged James White, because he's not worth engaging. But there are many people who are worth engaging. So Tim Keller is a pastor from New York, um, pretty well-known pastor, evangelical pastor, who I've learned a lot from. I think he's a great writer and preacher. He just reviewed my book a couple weeks ago. Um, and I didn't really, I mean, you know, it was a negative review, which wasn't surprising, because I know what he thinks about this topic. But I really appreciated that he did, because that he reviewed my book with a tone of civility. He didn't say horrendous things about gay people. Um, and he was focusing on my actual arguments, and in a way that was a bit more, a lot more level-headed. So that allowed me, you know, I wrote a response to it about things that I agreed with and a lot of things I didn't agree with and thought that he actually misrepresented in my book. But through that process, that is what opens the door to genuine, to genuine like conversation. It doesn't mean that he's going to agree with me anytime soon, but I want to focus on people who are engaging thoughtfully. Um, and so, and there are enough of them, like I can spend all my time doing that. <laughs> there you go. There's the entirety. Now, again, remember, um, we played the whole question and answer and allowed it to have its own context just as we played his entire one hour video presentation a few years ago when it came out uh you'll notice there were no direct quotations from me um made by matthew vines to my knowledge he has never done that and remember he acknowledged the response for years and instead of saying i you're a waste of my time um, and that was vitriolic. That was horrific. Instead, what he said was, I'll respond to it in my book. And we'll my book comes out. So now we have two completely different stories for coming from the same person. And what has changed? Well, the context of our society has changed. And therefore, Matthew Vines' um, recollection of things has changed. Now, of course, that's dishonest. And it's hypocritical. But um false teachers who are trying to overthrow the ones for all delivered the saints faith tend upon examination to fall into those categories basically um so let's let's go back and uh, we'll do what what matthew can't do and we will uh let him speak stop respond now people would love to see this happening live and one side's willing to do that and one side has accurately represented the other side. The other side's the one that doesn't want to do that because they recognize their position is indefensible. And now, of course, even more so because Matthew does know. You can sort of tell a couple places, like when he started talking about, uh, you know, comparing us to having sex with dogs. When he did that, you can just, you can hear the voice of a person who knows he's lying, who knows that he's being untruthful. And that's exactly what is, is going on here. So let's... Uh, Let's listen to what he has to say. And uh, yeah, that's, that's really great. Um, in terms of furthering that dialogue, uh, James White has offered to debate with you several times. I was curious what the reasons are that that uh, hasn't happened. Yeah, so when I posted my initial talk three years ago, there was a Southern Baptist. Um, of course, uh, I, I suppose the fact that there was a time when I was a Southern Baptist minister that that might be enough, but that time was um, before Matthew was born. <laughs> um, so uh, I, I am not a Southern Baptist. I am a Reformed Baptist. But when you're an ultra-liberal Presbyterian, uh, all Baptists are just sort of lumped into one big thing, I guess. Um, it, it does say a little bit something about the accuracy of you know his research but he hasn't done any research he's not interested in doing research about me because i don't matter i'm in the gutter i'm irrelevant just just keep that in mind whenever they're talking about whenever he's talking about well he's not really relational you know he's just not really nice <laughs> he's in the gutter you know there, there you go mm -hmm. in phoenix who recorded a four-hour rebuttal rebuttal podcast rebuttal to um rebuttal yeah it was a rebuttal 
And if you've listened to it, which you said you did, then you would know I played every single comment you made and then responded to every one of your arguments. Now remember, later on he says, well, you know, uh, Tim Keller, he, he responded to the arguments in my book. Um, the fact of the matter is, you've never presented a single argument that I didn't respond to. And anyone, again, who's heard that knows the truth. So why misrepresent it? Uh, why not tell them, well, he you know, did a four-hour response point by point to every single thing that I said and played the entirety of my presentation for his audience. That would have been the truthful statement, but that doesn't, you know, that's, that's like the mainstream media actually covering the Planned Parenthood thing or the mainstream media actually covering the murder of the woman over, was it San Francisco or something like that? In San Francisco. You know, they have a paradigm that they want to put out there. They have a story they want to put out there. If it doesn't fit, you don't cover it. You know, I think I retweeted somebody today. Uh, journalism is covering difficult stories with a pillow long enough to, to uh, holding them down till they stop moving. Uh, something along those lines. That's uh, that's journalism today, and um, so that would have been the honest thing to say. But that doesn't fit the uh, the the story, the storyline that Matthew wants to present. I talk. And, well, so here's what I would say. I, when I'm thinking about Christians who disagree with me on this topic, they lie along a spectrum. Or rather, Christians who don't vocally agree with me on this topic. They lie along a spectrum. You have a minority of people who are, are silent sympathizers, who may not fully agree with me, who may, may not. But those are the people who really, if you reach them with these arguments, it's like you've liberated them. And, and they finally like feel free to express. Now, please notice, what, is, what, is, what did he just say? Reach them with these what? These are arguments. He says he's putting forth arguments. So, arguments should be examined. Remember, this is a man who has in the past claimed to train Christians to go into our churches, into quote-unquote, non-affirming churches, which means believing churches for the past 2,000 years, and change our thinking with good arguments. Now, what would be the best way to demonstrate you have good arguments? Are they to present them only the people who already agree with those arguments, or the people who don't agree with those arguments? Seems pretty obvious to me. Um, but in our upside-down, topsy-turvy world, um, this is now what is being presented. Their beliefs, and they can become really passionate advocates. Then there are a lot of people in the middle, I'd say the majority of people in the middle, who passively hold negative beliefs, non-affirming beliefs about same-sex relationships, um, and who truly believe those things, but don't think about it a ton, would never write a letter to the editor about it, would never call up a radio show about it. That's where my dad was. Then you have a substantial minority of people who I would say are deeply entrenched and passionate about their opposition. Uh, and those people tend to be the most established people in any given church community, especially the more conservative churches. They tend to make institutional change very difficult because they will threaten to pull their financial giving from a church if it shifts at all on the topic. And so what I'm trying to do, and it, they also give the impression to... Now, now no. They're passionate, and they won't give money. How about they have really strong arguments that I well know in the depth of my soul I cannot refute? How about, how about that? Because I think that's really what's going on with Matthew. Matthew knows that the other side has arguments that he cannot refute. They've been presented to him. And so he's now, he's a smart young man, he's finding ways to excuse having to deal with the refutation of his own arguments while continuing to present them, knowing that they can be refuted. So he doesn't even, doesn't even mention, you know, well, they'll, they'll threaten to pull funny. These are, these are the, they're the people in charge and la, 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 la. How about they are passionately convinced of the position that the Christian church has held on this issue since its inception. How, how about that? And they, they actually take the time to read my books, book, singular, 
listened to my videos, and have responded to those things rather fully. In fact, on a level that I simply can't deal with. And so I need to come up with some way of dealing with this, and this is, this is how I do it. People that everyone in the community not only shares their belief, but also shares that passion with which they hold their belief, because no one else is actually saying anything. So they kind of have the megaphone. When I'm engaging people on this topic, I am most interested in engaging the people who are the silent sympathizers and the people in the middle. Because most people who are in that place of entrenched passion opposition cannot be reached um, right now. I don't ever. Uh, oh, okay, all right. Are you passionate and entrenched in your position? Again, why am I, why am I bothering to address? You're not gonna watch this. Is he passionately entrenched in his position? Obviously he is, but he doesn't want to acknowledge the existence of somebody on the other side because then he'd have to, then the obvious thing would be that our side shouldn't bother to engage at all with him. And yet that's the whole thing he wants to do. That's how he's gotten his, his attention is by saying, you, you must deal with, you must listen to us. But you see, I think part of this is also the homosexual mindset. Remember, Uber writes, you must celebrate who I am and what I do. Um, we are special, you are not. We are special, you are not. You're normal, you're regular, we're, we're specially gifted. I mean, that is that not what we are hearing every single day now? Is that not what is being shoved into our face every single day? Is we're special, you're not. Uh, our rights are more important than your rights, you will celebrate us. Um, that's what that's what we're hearing here. Yes. Can I interject here that um, no on his point about the spectrum that went over real well. Yeah, I know. Uh, his point about the spectrum, you have commented about your debating audiences on numerous occasions, mm -hmm. and you point out that on the one hand you've got the opposition, the hardcore, and on the other hand you've got your own following, the hardcore, and there's the group in the middle, and you're not. You're there knowing that your opponent is hardcore. He's entrenched in that position, yep. and your point is to talk to those in the middle. You understand the spectrum of the audience. He just dismissed an entire spectrum of the audience that he won't even have an interaction with. And, of course, if he was at all convinced of the weight of his arguments, then he would want, if he actually thought his arguments were good arguments and they would survive against me, uh, he would want to debate me to demonstrate that, not only for the people on his side, but for the people on my side as well. You see, one, one of the things that has bothered me in trying, in, in even going back and forth on Twitter with Matthew, is we have completely different reasons for doing what we do. Um, he is not the reason why I'm responding to him. It's not about him. It's about something so much bigger than either one of us. But for him, it's all about him. You have to be nice to me. It's my time. It's, it's what's worth me doing. It's all me, 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 me. And that's why if you even talk about bestiality, pedophilia, incest, in other words, if you go to Leviticus 18, look at the Holiness Code, and talk about what all these sins are about and how they're all connected in attacking the Imago Dei, it doesn't matter that you're dealing with the Bible and he's not. He will be offended because it's all about him. Now, there's all sorts of stuff in what he said here that if I were interested, it was all about me, I would just be massively offended. But I'll be honest with you, I don't care because it's not about me. Yes, he's being mean. Yes, he's being disrespectful. Yes, he's being a hypocrite. So what? Big deal. The issue and how people respond to it, that's, that's what's important. So we have completely different motivations for what we do. Completely different motivations. And you see, in the touchy-feely, all emotions, I'm just a little kid, millennial generation, I don't want to grow up. I don't want to become an adult. Um, I, I just want to do me, me, me stuff. Uh, amongst those folks, he looks like the nice guy because it's all about him. 
rather than recognizing, you know what? Um, that's really immature. And that really isn't going to promote human flourishing. Let's use that term. Let's borrow a, a molarism for the moment. But very, very different motivations for what we're doing. I try never to write people off entirely, but I do postpone people. And I will postpone engagement with some people because the way that they think and talk about these topics is so unhelpful and so devoid of any kind of relational um, care or understanding. Unhelpful and devoid of relational care and understanding. Uh, that's, that's the terminology. Yeah, I've got it right here. So devoid of any kind of relational care understanding uh, that I don't think they're really not worth my energy, is what he's going to say just now. So, in other words, he gets to define and then interpret you and your uh, reasons for doing things. And so if you don't fit his paradigm, well, you're just not worth his energy. Again, it's all Matthew Vines. It's all about me. And there is a direct connection here to homosexualism, because what fundamentally is the error of homosexual attraction? It's narcissistic. It's falling in love with the mirror image. It's more me. My me, me, me. That's where the immaturity is. I mean, when we were boys, at seven years of age, you just wanted to play with other boys. You didn't want to play with girls. They had cooties. Um, besides, some of them were growing faster than we were, and sometimes they could outrun you, and so that was a bad thing. So... Um, but they couldn't throw like you could, and a, pff, no girl has ever been able to make battle noises or any other kind of sound effects like guys can. We I, we have, and it's it's an irrefutable point. There's absolutely no question that that's an irrefutable point. I mean, by the time you're seven years of age, you can make the sound of a machine gun, uh, you know, prop propel airplanes, dive bombing stuff, and girls. Pff, this uh, can't do it. So, um, but you see, then something happened, and we grew up, and we grew out of that, and that's not something that's happened in the homosexual experience, and so there is a self focus. There is a me, 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 me. That's what you have, um, and that's what you're hearing here. That I don't, that that's not really worth my energy. So James White in his talk, I mean, he compared being gay to wanting to have sex with dogs and things. Um, that's just a lie. Okay, I mean, it's out there. Um, I had folks go through it and specifically send me every reference um, whatsoever to the subject of uh, bestiality. And I, I, I'm sorry, but it, it's the, the reality is it's a lie. And I think, I don't know, just looking at his face, the, the way that he's sort of uh, um, looking at things, um, he knows it's a lie. He knows he's trying to have to promote something here. Let me, let me give you um, every statement in my entire presentation that could even be remotely connected to anything he's saying here. All right? And I again, I, I want to thank uh, the folks in channel that listened. Uh, part one, 23 minutes, 50 seconds in. I want to be married to my German shepherd, and I want to start a family with my German shepherd. I was talking about the impossibility of defining families any way I want to do so. Didn't say anything about sex with German shepherds or dogs and uh, 3545, how about a how about high quality bestiality versus low quality bestiality? And again, the issue was comparing the idea of uh, there being some kind of a better form of a sin versus a lesser form of a sin. And I'm drawing again from the biblical holiness code, which specifically in Leviticus 18, rather painstakingly, goes through a number of sins, which includes all sorts of forms of incest, 
homosexuality and bestiality. It's right there. It's been there for 3,400 years, approximately. Um, So do forgive me for providing biblical answers to your biblical claims. But again, he can get away with this because he knows no one's going to check him out. Not, Not anybody he cares about. He doesn't care about you and me. Because he knows, he knows we know. <laughs> he knows we know. He's got to go for the ignorant people. He can't go for the people who already know. Which tells me he knows his arguments are not going to work. Uh, in part two, at 16 minutes, 30 minutes, the exchanging of natural for what is against nature, creatures not only... Okay. Okay. The exchanging of what's natural for what is against nature. Yeah, that's not really... That's not really... I mean, it's Romans 1, but... And then there were two others... In part one, at 154.55, prohibitions against bestiality. Just mentioned it in Leviticus. And at 228.30, the commandment against bestiality is repeated more often than the commandment against homosexuality in response to Vine's direct bestiality assertion. I'm not sure who was saying that, because obviously the commandment against bestiality is not repeated more often than the commandment against homosexuality, at least in the New Testament. I'm not sure what the context was there. But the point is, there is nothing about anyone desiring to have sex with dogs being compared to homosexuals. Uh, the closest thing is, I can't have a family with a German Shepherd. I don't even have a German Did I still have a German Shepherd back then? Well, I don't know. Maybe I... Well, we had a German Shepherd, but and she died only a few years ago, so it's possible. It's possible. Maybe that's where I came with it. Anyways, um, so the, the whole thing's bogus. I, I mean... This is, this is clearly an attempt to misrepresent the other side because he's not going to, he's not going to sit there and say, you know, he was really passionate, but he, he responded to every single element of my argumentation. He talked about Toe Va. He went through the Holiness Code. He went through Romans 1. He talked about Arsenicoites. He went into the original language. That's not going to fit the dismissive, disrespectful, marginalization paradigm that he wants to put out. So, why why tell the truth when a lie is going to work just as well? And in fact, given the context of our society today, a lie is actually going to work better. You know, why bother? So, there you go. So absurd and so offensive. And he was so passionate about it and saw no reason, you know, talked about comparisons to pedophilia and said that only, you know, one person... Okay. Comparisons to pedophilia. What do you mean by that? I mean, are, are you saying that it is inappropriate to point out the fact, the reality, that this very day there are a growing number of articles appearing in scholarly works identifying pedophilia as a sexual orientation. That there is an entire movement. There, the, the German... Did I have it in here? Let me see real quick if I, if I save this. Um, the German... Uh, the nation of Germany is advertising. Yeah, it's not here. I, I thought I had saved it to uh, to Evernote. Is 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 doing an advertisement? They've they've started a private treatment program for people who experience sexual desire for young for young folks for pedophiles, and you can get free help without being turned over to the police. And the whole idea behind it is it's a sexual orientation. So all it will take will be a few more articles, one good Hollywood movie, and voila. Um, it's take, and, and, and are we wrong are, to, to go, huh, you take this and then you look at Oregon which is now saying that if a 15-year-old will come to, not their parents, but to the government 
and want a sex change operation, the government will pay for it without notifying the parents. Hmm. You can't get in a tanning bed at 15 in Oregon, but you can change your sex. And if you can change your sex at 15 without talking to your parents about it, what is the logical or rational reason for saying you cannot engage in sex at 15? Seems to be coming together for some odd, strange reason. Can't talk about that? Yeah, see, what you need to understand, folks, is that for the Matthew Vines of the world, you can't talk about anything that demonstrates that they're, what they're pushing for is destructive of human culture and life. You just can't talk about those things. Or you'll be non-nice. And if anyone's not nice, then you shouldn't listen to them. Now, is it nice to do what he's doing here? I mean, I just ask all you millennials that are just so into your emotions and feelings, just logically speaking for a moment, is, is this nice? Is it nice to do this? Is it, is it nice to, to shut down truthful conversation by appealing to emotions and talking about people not being nice? Is that nice? Well, I leave that to you to, uh, to think about. Of gay people actually want monogamy. I don't know where he got that statistic. I, I think what he's talking about there, and I, I don't remember that that far back. I, I think this is something that's been, maybe people have reported to him something since then, but simply looking at the percentage of self identifying homosexuals. Remember, what's the big theme? that Matthew Vines and James Brownson and all the quote unquote, you know, David Gushy, all the allies and stuff, stuff. What's the line? Loving, committed, and what's the third term? Monogamous, homosexual, lifelong homosexual relationships. Isn't that the phrase? What percentage of the male homosexual community is celibate until quote unquote marriage and desires that kind of interaction. Just just looking at the numbers regarding the sexual activities of male homosexuals. What percentage? Matthew. Again, why am I bothering? He's not gonna listen. He doesn't need to anymore. From his perspective, they've already won this, this battle. It's already done. What percentage? Uh, I don't even, you know, we've, we went, th I, I do remember going through, if it wasn't during that, it was shortly after, I remember going through that section in Michael Brown's book, A Queer Thing Happened to America, where you provide a lot of that information. There have been a few studies that have come out since then. Um, but the numbers speak for themselves when homosexuals honestly speak about themselves, especially males. The numbers are a little bit different for females, but especially for males, there is a, um, a tremendous amount of promiscuity, which you never hear these guys talking about. I don't. I don't hear him talking about it. I don't hear these quote-unquote gay Christians uh, pointing these things out. They're supposed to if they're... But you know, I, I don't... If I don't you just them. took their own rhetoric, you'd think they're the, the most monogamous people on the planet. Well, from what they say. Yeah. And, and there it was a highly vitriolic four hours. And honestly, that's not worth my time. Okay, I, I, we may make this a, uh, a, a soundbite. Um... You know, maybe we can uh, attach it at the end, you know, of the, uh, you know, do a little something, record it, put it at the end and say, now, if what you just listened to um, helped you to understand what the issues were, if you appreciate the amount of time that was invested in it, please note that years after this was recorded, years after 
Matthew Vines said he'd respond to it in the book and that he would debate when the book came out and so on and so forth. Listen to what he says now. Compare Matthew Vines 2015 with Matthew Vines 2013. And what changed? My presentation didn't change during that time period. Um, but the culture has changed, and now Matthew Vines is deciding to... Well, if you can revise the history of Christianity, if you can revise the Bible itself, why not revise this? It's obviously worked. It works with his audience, so hey, let's, let's go for it, right? Because there are so many people who are worth my time and who are thoughtful and kind, and there are some people who are... Now remember, I, I, thoughtful and kind. Thoughtful and kind. So, if you disagree with him, you're not kind. And if you refute his arguments, you must not be thoughtful. All based upon the assumption. He's at Google. Do you think anybody at Google is actually going to take five hours to listen to that interaction? Five hours to listen to the gushy interaction? You can, you know, as long as you're assuming that your audience has a very, very you know, you're, you're talking about low information audience now. Low information, lo, LILs, low information listeners, or LIVs, low information viewers, whatever you want to call them. That's the assumption here. I mean, this is really disrespectful to the audience. Anytime you misrepresent something, you're being disre disrespectful to the audience. But this is over the top. Really vitriolic and who are not kind, are not compassionate. And I am not, like, my time is worth so much more than like wasting it, going down into a gutter with people who want to compare me to like people who want to have sex with dogs. So to do what he said he would do on Twitter is to go down in the gutter. Which one is it? Who, who can tell? Uh, it sounds like we're listening to a politician, doesn't it? You know, didn't you say back in 2012 yeah, but that was 2012. And, uh, you know, maybe he's already deleted all of his tweets from his server, so he doesn't have to worry about it anymore. So that's the reason why I haven't engaged James White, because he's not worth engaging. But not worth it. there are many people who are worth engaging. So Tim Keller is a pastor from New York, um, pretty well-known pastor, evangelical pastor, who I've learned a lot from. I think he's a great writer and preacher. He just reviewed my book a couple weeks ago, um, and I didn't really, I mean, you know, it was a negative review, which wasn't surprising, because I know what he thinks about this topic, but I really appreciated that he did, because that he reviewed my book with a tone of civility. He didn't say horrendous things about gay people, um, and he was focusing on my actual arguments, and in a way that was a bit more a lot more level-headed. So that allowed me, you know, I wrote a response to it about things that I agreed with and a lot of things I didn't agree with and thought that he actually misrepresented in my book. But through that process, that is what opens the door to genuine, to genuine like, conversation. It doesn't mean that he... Now, again, remember, and, and this, go back on the blog, search for Matthew Vine's name, you'll see the tweets that went back and forth between us. From his perspective, genuine conversation begins with my admitting his claims to being a gay Christian. If I won't admit that, if I won't start by conceding the debate, then it's not a genuine conversation. That's, that's, that's how simplistic and, and childish this position really is, but, but but that's the nature of the position. You have to admit that I I am what I claim that I am. You have to give me, you have to celebrate me before we will then discuss any of this stuff. That's, you know, debates wouldn't happen uh, if, uh, if that was, if that was how you had to do things. But again, we do things for very different reasons. Mr. Vines and myself. ...to agree with me anytime soon, but I want to focus on people who are engaging thoughtfully, um, and so, and there are enough of them, like, I can spend all my time doing that. <laughs> so there you go. There's, um, there's Matthew Vines, 
and uh, he's right. He can uh, he can he can find folks to engage with um, who will never challenge him, who will never point out his errors, who will never point out his reliance upon sources that he cannot verify one way or the other, um, who will never hold his feet to the fire for the claims that he makes. He can spend all of his time on CNN and places like that where he will never, ever, ever be challenged. He, he most definitely can do that. Most people do. Um, but as a Christian, I can't do that. And once again, it just simply demonstrates the vast difference between Matthew Vines and myself. So, I know he's not going to watch this, um, but if you have people who see this, or, you know, he puts it in writing here, there, or he's put portions of it in, in writing in some of the comments he's made. Um, maybe you can direct them to this. They can hear the other side of the story. They can listen to the review. And then they'll join the chorus of many others that would say, man, it would be so helpful to hear this debated. Because up, if, if it's not debated, then it's just one side says this, the other side says that, and oh, I'd love to hear the two sides have to discuss it and to do so under under control with control so that you don't have one side beating up the other side just simply by having all the time to themselves, you know, moderated. That would be so useful. It's the only way that we can really see how these arguments are going to play out. One side wants it. The other side does not. And I think this gives you a very good picture of why the other side doesn't want it because they know they could never survive it. And secondly, because now they don't feel there's any positive. There was a time in the past, there might have been something just simply to gain the audience, gain some respectability. But hey, thanks to Justice Kennedy, we don't have to worry about that anymore. Because by the very language of his... Again, I... I the term decision is not right. It, it, that, that assumes something that did not happen. But by the language that he used in writing what he wrote, he has identified the historic Christian position as bigotry. So, um, the wicked strut about when what is vile is honored amongst men. There you go. That's that's my response to um, to Matthew Vines and his comments uh, at Google. Um, and again, I appreciate the uh, transcript that we have placed on uh, on Facebook. And uh, there's my response. Hope it's hope it's useful to you. All right, now, um, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> someone in channel who I won't mention for other reasons says, uh, did I hear Matthew Vines call Dr. White a Southern Baptist pastor in Phoenix? That's offensive. <laughs> yeah, to a lot of people, it would be. A lot of people, it would be. Um, okay. Let's, I, I mentioned on Facebook, we were going to absolutely um, try to see if we could destroy the clutch of the program. Now, I'm not sure where the clutch is installed. Um, but we're, we're going to see just how wide a range of topics we could get to. And so I announced three. I might, you know, I'll see how the time is here. And might do some more after this. We'll see. We'll see. But this is going to be a wide-ranging series of of topics, big time. I have another video to play. And it's sort of hard for me to imagine a bigger difference between the level of scholarship of who I'm going to be disagreeing with now and disagree with Matthew Vines, because Matthew Vines does not have any level of scholarship. Again, um, 
when you're borrowing your arguments from everybody else, there, there, there you go. Um, I was sent a link to this clip a few weeks ago. I'm not sure exactly when, and I'm sorry that I don't remember who sent it to me. Downloaded it, thought, yeah, maybe something to, mm -hmm, maybe something worth doing. And by the time I got around to it, I, I, I couldn't even go back to figure out who sent it to me. So I apologize that I can't go. Hey, thank you to whoever. Some of you will remember a discussion. Um, that took place on the unbelievable, unbelievable radio broadcast between myself and Dr. Professor Bishop N.T. Wright, or as he wants to be called, Tom. We discussed in very short form some of his, well, unique views on the concept of justification. And as I said at the time, N.T. Wright is a brilliant, brilliant man. I mean, there is no question of the man's breadth of knowledge. But to be honest with you, it's also painfully obvious that N.T. Wright sort of suffers from the same issue that Bart Ehrman suffers from. And that is he sort of believes his own press, and there are certain scholars that believe that they are so far above anybody else that they're willing to go out on limbs that others would not be willing to go out on. And so the result is that, that right Obviously, I do not believe that N.T. Wright is balanced. I don't believe Wright is right on certain things. He has brilliant insights in other areas. And as I mentioned in the weeks after our encounter, I do find a lot of the criticisms of some of the things that he says to be themselves showing not as much understanding of where he's coming from as should be, should be there. But the, the paradigm that he enforces upon the New Testament that ends up requiring him to adopt some rather unusual translations of certain texts that, that go against all other translations, he, he, doesn't, he doesn't mind saying, yeah, everybody but me has been wrong about this. He doesn't mind saying that. That paradigm, which includes the, I, I think, a, a major overemphasis upon exile themes um, and a major underemphasis upon soteriology, coupled with a overemphasis upon ethnic Israel, a few things like that. You, you put it all together, and you get what we're about to listen to. And that is, he's asked a simple question about predestination and election in the New Testament. Now, I understand he's giving a brief response. And sometimes when you're asked to give a brief response, I've been asked to give brief responses to very difficult questions before that, to be honest with you, when I got done, I felt like saying, well, man, that was a waste of time. Because you really can't answer that question in a brief amount of time and do so properly. I had somebody tell me that I used the term meaningfully way too often yesterday, so I'm going to try to come up with something else, at least for a week or two. Um, so, listen to his reply here. And listen to how many times he says, now, now, I'm not denying there's not a mystery here. Almost sounds Lutheran for a second, but he gets a little Bardian for a while and, and invokes a little mystery. And just, just listen for yourself and go... Hmm. Don't you think that someone who's written, what, an 1,800-page book on Paul might be able to be a little more clear? Or is it really his viewpoint that you can't be? Um, you'll see. Okay, here we go. We're going to launch off.
record. So you're asking Dr. Wright, what does he think Paul means when he uses the language like election, election, chosen, predestination? Okay, there's three passages in particular. There's Romans 8, 28 following. Um, those who are called according to his purpose. Um, and, and then he talks, he goes into that great riff about those he predestined, he also called, those he called, he also justified, those he justified, he also glorified. Um, let's just take that one for a minute. That is a sharp, close-up, compressed telling of the story of Israel as the chosen people whose identity and destiny is then brought into sharp focus on Jesus and in a sense Jesus is the one chosen one this sounds very Barthian I don't know if some of you studied Karl Barth but at this point it would be going with um, but then that identity is shared with all those who are in Christ and he isn't surprisingly talking primarily there about salvation he's talking primarily about the way God is healing the whole creation there's a danger you see what has happened in so many uh, theological circles over the years is that people have come to the texts assuming that it's really saying how do we get to heaven and what's the mechanism and how does that work and if you do that interestingly many exegetes will more or less skip over Romans 8 18 through 26 7 ish which is about the renewing of creation when humans are glorified, i.e. put in charge. That's the actual subject of the, of the passage. That's not to say there isn't a mystery there, but Paul isn't addressing it, and we have to be a bit careful about pushing him into a corner where he just hasn't gone. The second passage would be Ephesians 1, um, 3 to 14, where, again, um, blessed be the God and Father, etc., and he, he destined us in love to be his sons. Um, and this, again, it's very much an Israel story, very much an Exodus story. So it goes back through Deuteronomy and Exodus where... Um, God says to Israel, it wasn't because you were more numerous than anyone else that the Lord chose you, it's because he loved you and had purposes for you. So again, it's sort of so that you might be the people through whom his glory would move out into the world. And then the really difficult passage, of course, is Romans 9 to 11. But actually there, I mean, and it is a hugely difficult and wonderfully complex, intricate passage. Um, but as I say in a rather long section on it in my new book, which you might like to read one day, um, <laughs> um, there's um, the, the, the sense, uh, yet again, what he's doing is telling the story of Israel so that it then ultimately focuses on Jesus himself. But the point then, which has so often been missed, is that he is not talking about a theory of how people get saved or not. What he's saying is, and it's a very difficult and tricky thing to say, is that God's dealings with unbelieving Israel are, as it were, a reflection of, or throwing up onto the historical screen of, God's dealings with his own son. Because the question is, why has God apparently cast off his people? You know, what on earth has God up to? He made promises to the Jews that he would do A, B, and C, and he's now done them. And they turn around and say they don't want it. it has, has, does this mean the word of God has failed? And Paul develops this very careful and subtle picture in which he says, no, actually, even this too was part of God's plan because by their casting away, salvation has come to the Gentiles. If, if Israel had believed straight off the top, then actually any Gentiles coming in would have had just to be part of Israel. Whereas the point, as he says at the end of Romans 11, is that God has subjected all to disobedience so that all who come, it might be my, by mercy. And so he's exploring the very strange ways in which the Christ-shaped cross and resurrection shaped pattern of salvation has actually been writ large into the story of Israel. The danger, as I say, is that so much Western theology, medieval and post-medieval reformation, has pulled back from thinking about Israel at all. You can read many works in that tradition that just don't deal with the question of Israel. Um, but if you take that out, it looks as though he's producing an abstract theory of predestination. This isn't to say that there isn't a mystery, because there is a mystery. Um, because in a group before today, I'm not a universalist. I do think it's possible for people to say no and for God, as it were, to honour that no, even though that's always strange and dark and kind of chaotic and tragic. Um, but 
uh, I don't think at any point in the scriptures are we given an answer to the question we want to ask. Her. If God is a puppet master, why is he pulling these strings and not those strings? And the answer is actually that's not what it's like. God is not a puppet master. We are, we are humans. We are in his image. And it's more subtle and complicated than that. Okay. Sorry, uh, yes. Right. Okay. Again, when you're sitting in front of an audience, someone's taking questions, you, you try to be concise. Okay, I, I get all that. Um, but, but, the imbalance here seems striking to me. Romans 9 through 11 is how God is dealing with his son. And, and seemingly rejected his his son. Uh, I'm sorry. There, there. You have to be importing these grand external conclusions, and then playing pretty fast and loose with the text at that point um, to come up with that. I mean, it's not all Israel who are Israel has something to do with the rejection of Jesus. It's the children of the promise that that account. It's the Sorry, um, Ephesians one. You start get, getting Bardian about Jesus being the elect one. Yeah, I you know I I hear reform folks doing that too. And um, in Ephesians one, Jesus is the one in whom we are chosen, but he's not the elect one. The direct object is us. You you, you just you can't get around that. It's it's direct. It's personal. And one of the things that bugs me about N.T. Wright is his constant minimalization of soteriology with the assertion of, well, you know, it's not just about how we get to heaven, as if how we get to heaven is all of soteriology. Um, there's just... I, I think if I had the same amount of time and address the same amount of text, I could have been a lot clearer than that. And partly because he knows that the presuppositional framework he has created is absolutely unique to himself. And hence, he, he really can't assume that the audience is going to have any kind of... Uh, is going to resonate with it or have any understanding of uh, of what's there. So, I, I just wanted to provide that and um, say, see, the where you start, if, if, you, if you bring in things at the start, presuppositionally to your, your hermeneutics, and, and uh, again, N.T. Wright has done tremendous work when he's dealing with texts that don't, that are not overly influenced by his imbalances. Uh, he really has. But when it comes to areas like this, uh, very, very troubling and uh, not, not overly, not really useful. Um, Uh, I'm sorry? You've been busy, but uh, Haseem, King of Graphics, has found Matthew Vines' original tweets where he agreed. I wondered. I saw the... So it was January January 2014? Yeah. Uh, Well, January 2014 is where he agrees and and points out that he's still looking forward to it. But go down a little bit more, and you're going to find May 26, 2013... The book comes out in early 2014, several months after the conference, so we'll have to arrange something for then or beyond. I didn't even see that. Good. Well, uh, hopefully... I retweeted it, so... I don't see it on mine. Then again, I don't follow you. No, I do. <laughs> but it's not It's not on mine. I don't know why. So May 26, 2013, he pretty clearly agreed oh, yeah. to do that. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. No doubt about it. Definitely, yeah. Things, things change for some reason. Yeah, but, something tells me a publicist will change. A pu- your publicist change. <laughs> this is uh, this is true. All right, now to demonstrate uh, our ability to completely, completely destroy the clutch of the program. I mean, it was a pretty big shift to go from Matthew Vines to N.T. Wright. Now I'm going to shift all the way over to Durban, South Africa, last October. Uh, Once again, to remind you, 
uh, that we have a trip coming up, and your support of this ministry helps to allow that to happen, um, including just the general support of the ministry, because the ministry has to keep going even when I'm gone. Um, so the reality is that we're heading down to South Africa. There are costs associated with that uh, on every end. So um, just providing for the ministry would be most helpful right now in preparation for this. And um, I'm very excited about the fact that aside, well, first of all, um, the Muslims in South Africa are trying to bring Shabir Ali back to South Africa to debate with me in South Africa once again. Um, that's exciting. And then there will be an expansion of our topics in South Africa. I'm not sure how this is going to uh, work out, but can I be Christian and homosexual? A debate with Graham Codrington, who I guess is sort of the South African Matthew Vines. Um, presenting gay Christianity. And uh, he has uh, expressed his willingness to debate, not just the way that Matthew Vines did, uh, but knowing that I'm coming there in October. And so uh, this trip will include lecture series on um, Bart Ehrman, on the deity of Christ, debating the subject of homosexuality. By the way, the profaning of marriage took place in South Africa years ago. Years ago. Um, and the continued dialogue with, uh, with Muslims there in South Africa as well. So uh, that's all coming up. And uh, your support in uh, being able to do that is very, very important. Uh, I wanted to do this back in like November, and things happen. You know, we we get buried with stuff, and I, I've got stuff. Uh, you know, I, I've I've got a final that I I've got a bunch of grading that I've got to be doing over the next two weeks. Just a tremendous amount of grading, and. If it ends up in my inbox, it just keeps getting pushed down. If it's not at the top, I feel terrible. It uh, th Things happen, and that's what happened with this as well. Yes, shifting to a Muslim topic. If you're thinking about tuning out, however, because ah, it's Islam, you know, what can I say? Uh, you might want to stick around, because if, if I have time... I might make some comments about some stuff that happened on Twitter yesterday. Maybe. We'll see. I'm not promising anything. Um, I'm not sure how I'm going to do this. Um, let, let me just play a little portion from Yusuf Ismail. This is in the Juma Masjid in Durban, South Africa. I'm not going to play the whole thing. I'll, I'll sort of have to fill in because it takes him a while to get around to his point, basically. And I have the book up, so I'll sort of make it for you. But here's a section. This is the section. We did two sections, the Christology of John, the Christology of the Quran. This is in the second half toward the end of the debate. And so let's let uh, Yusuf speak for himself here. Now, we're looking at Arabia, the context in which, you see, I, huh. I assumed, I knew what the argument was. I don't know why that's, why does that happen at times? the um it's out of sync it's not out of sync in the file because i've watched it before why does that happen um well just listen to it try to ignore the out of sync part i i don't know why that happens but it does now we're looking at arabia the context in which you see i i assumed i knew what the argument was tonight i already knew what james is going to say and James is saying, the basic thrust is, how is the Quran addressing people who didn't believe in what they have? Well, thanks to a mutual friend of ours, Dr. Shabir Ali, uh, he recommended this book to me, The Bible in Arabic, The Scripture of the People of the Book in the Language of Islam by Sidney Griffiths. Have you, have you come across? You haven't come across this book yet. 
This book, this particular individual, he's a scholar. He's a specialist in Arab Christianity, in the history of Arab Christianity. He's a specialist. We'll focus on a bit of his writings. Basically, he goes on to suggest, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, James. You're very honorable. You're an honorable man. No, don't, don't do that. We don't want to intimidate James. We don't want to intimidate myself. He wasn't that for me. Come on. Oh, yeah. He did that for James. <laughs> Certainly. Takbir. Oh, <laughs> okay. What basically, what Sidney Griffith says, Sidney Griffith is an Arabic scholar. And what he says is that in the context of the 6th century, recognizing the Quran's Christians, a wealth of information that exists, he says that scholars have basically gathered evidence providing that the major Christian communities in Arabia were the Malkites, the Jacobites, and the Nestorians. That's in, in the historical context in, whom the, in which the Quran was in fact addressing. And he, he quotes on a book by a world-renowned scholar called Irfan Shahid, Rome and the Arabs, uh, a pro to the study of Byzantium and the Arabs, Byzantium and the Arabs in the 4th century, in the 5th century, in the 6th century, in volumes 1 and 2. It basically deals with the identity of the Arab Christians in the immediate pre-Islamic context. And what Sidney Griffiths points out is that these Christians, in fact, did have the beliefs that you claim those Christians never, in fact, possessed. Now, I'm trying to I'm trying to summarize this. Obviously, the entirety of the debate you you can watch it for yourself, and and if you feel I'm cutting them off too short, listen like that. But the the book, the scriptures, the the Bible in Arabic. I obviously got hold of it as soon as the debate was over. In fact, I think I got it while I was still there uh, via Kindle. I'm not sure. No, I couldn't have because that's that's next to impossible to do in South Africa. Anyway, um, what basically is being argued is when I look at the text of the Quran, I'm asking a simple question. Do I have a basis in the text itself and see my Muslim friends you gotta understand not do I have a basis in later Islamic orthodoxy but do I have a basis in the text itself because you'll have to admit there's tafsir literature that you reject um, some of the early tafsir do not follow the later rules that were developed and so you don't uh, uh, Mukato, for example, very, very important material, but you you reject it because it doesn't follow the later standards, things like that. But that tafsir literature, that interpretive literature of the Quran, I want to look at the text itself, not how it's interpreted later on. And and I find most of you to be very hesitant. And in fact, on this, on these very texts, whether it be Surah five forty seven, Surah five one sixteen. I'm getting completely different interpretations from pretty much every person I debate. I've got a different interpretation from Basam Zawadi, which actually Yusuf mentioned his disagreement with Zawadi here in just a few seconds later on in, in this clip. Um, I've got Basam Zawadi, um, I've got Abdullah Kunda, I've got Yusuf Ismail, I've got Shabir Ali, and they're all varying from one another. There's no consistency there. And this is partly because I've said for a long time there's a vast difference between interpreting the text of the Quran and interpreting the text of the New Testament. We have so much more knowledge about the background of the New Testament than we have about the Quran that it's very difficult to do verse by verse type exegesis of the Quran itself. Anyway, the whole reason I raised this issue is because Yusuf used this as evidence that, well, actually the Quran does show knowledge of what Christians were believing at this particular point in time. Well, first of all, Griffiths admits that he is presenting a very minority perspective in scholarship. Let me give an example from his book. Um, this is right before the section that I, I want to focus on. Scholars have not, this is talking about Surah, uh, Surah Al-Maida 73, Surah 573. Um, the historically troublesome term for commentators, both ancient and modern, the passage quote above from Surah, Surah 573, is the phrase, Thalith Thalathatin, one of three, 
sometimes translated as third of three. That Allah is the third of three. Say not that Allah is third of three. Scholars have not heretofore, so here he's admitting he's going out on his own here, recognized it as reflecting an epithet of Jesus the Messiah common in mainstream Christian Syriac homiletic texts in the adjectival form Clithia, meaning one of three, treble, trine, and referring to Jesus the Son of God as one of three in the Trinity, and as typologically characterized by three on account of having spent three hours on the cross and three days in the tomb, just as Jonah spent three days in the belly of the whale. Once the phrase is recognized as an Arabic rendering of the not uncommon Syriac epithet for Jesus the Messiah, the two verses quoted above, Surah al maida 72 and 73, Surah 5, can be seen to be affirming the same judgment about the infidelity of those who say, in the Quran's polemically inspired rendering, God is the Messiah, Mary's son, or God is one of three. Now, what, you, what, you need, what we need to understand here, what I'll try to explain to you why this is relevant, I'm sort of wondering, Yusuf, and as well for you, Shabir, at your use of sources again. Because are you really willing to start saying, in light of Sunni orthodoxy, that the Quran has eternally existed and is uncreated, are you agreeing with Griffith that the source of this terminology is pre-existing Syriac descriptions of Jesus? Because it's very clear that what Griffiths is saying is that the Quran, the author of the Quran, now I just, I completely disagree with Griffiths at this point. I, I'm sorry. I, I find no basis for believing that the author of the Quran was, had this level of knowledge of the specific terminology of the various groups in Christianity and actually understood the arguments they were having like the Nestorians or something like that. There's, I, I see nothing in the Quran to substantiate this at all. But the problem is, if you want to go with Griffiths on this, how do you maintain orthodox, how do you maintain Sunni orthodoxy? Because Griffiths' perspective is clearly that the Quran is drawing from this source and this source and this source and this source and drawing all these things together and compiling these things together I thought this was, well, it's ironic, um, we're right at the end of Ramadan, so we're in the week where Muslims argue about which day Laylat al-Qadr is. And why is Laylat al-Qadr so important? Because Laylat al-Qadr is the night upon which the Quran was sent down to Jibreel as a body. And it's the night of power. And if you accept that, then you can't accept that the author of the Quran was was drawing from all these different... It's, it's something the Quran itself denies that Muhammad was doing, is drawing from all these different sources and putting together a polemic based upon, at times, even in Griffith's perspective, even misunderstanding. Um, or at least understandable misunderstandings or something along those those lines. Are you really wanting to go here? Because once you start going to the idea of recognizing the various sources that the author of the Quran was using, where do you stop? Where do you stop? Um, there's all sorts of, of, of huge gaping black holes that open at that point in the Tafsir literature that would be considered orthodox Sunni over against westernized stuff that is willing to start talking about what did Muhammad actually have access to and knowledge of. Because Griffiths obviously is not operating on the idea that the Quran is the result of a single man named Muhammad. So where are you going to go here? What sources are you going to use? Um, I'm sure I'll be talking with Yusuf again uh, in South Africa, and I'm gonna, I want to ask this question, you know, because uh, he was talking, he, you know, inconsistency, the sign of a failed argument. All right, let's see where you're being. Let's. Am I being inconsistent? 
I'll I'll happily try to answer any accusations of that. But what about you guys? It, it seems that the more we push on this, um, the more willingness there is to maybe back off from some foundational elements of Sunni orthodoxy that would have, well, uh, let me just add this, and I am going to go long, so we may we may be going mega here, sorry. Have all day, yeah. <laughs> um, I had a really neat opportunity uh, to speak in Denver on Sunday, and I've, I've had some conversations really recently there with a, a Muslim afterwards, who, by the way, is an avid listener of the Divine Island. I had a Muslim, did I, I didn't tell you about this, I had a Muslim come up to me at L2 Church in Denver on Sunday morning, and in his notes, he quoted to me from what I said on the June 23rd Dividing Line. We have a very interesting audience. And if you're listening, my friend, I appreciate our conversation. But I think you would have to admit, because you, I'm not going to, I couldn't honestly identify you because I don't think you gave me your last name anyways. But you got to admit, you know, I agreed with you. Nominalism is a big thing. I appreciate the fact that you resonated with much of what I was saying. Believing Muslims, talking with believing Christians, that's that's an important thing. But you got to admit, you're not an Orthodox Sunni Muslim. You pretty much dismissed the Hadith. Now, there's there's more people out there. I've I wish I remember what the name of the... Um, I'm going to go ahead and close this and see if I can find it. No, I don't have time to find it, but uh, I wish there was a a search function in in titles because I know that I... I wonder if it's by title. I, I read a book via Kindle just recently on... and and basically the Muslim author was arguing that what we need to do, and this was a book recommended by Shabir Ali, and I need to track it down. I, I The name of it has has uh, escaped me, but anyways, it was a Muslim author who was basically saying we need to really rethink the Hadith and our commitment to it. And I've, I was asked, is there any possibility for reformation within Islam? In light of ISIS and things like that, is there any possibility of reformation? To the Muslims who are watching this, and especially to the Muslims like the gentleman I talked to after the debate in Southern California, uh, the gentleman I talked to there in Denver, thoughtful Muslims who are troubled by ISIS and things like that, you and I both know the only way that there could be reformation in Islam is to fundamentally reject the everything outside of the Quran and to reinterpret the later sections of the Quran in a fairly radical way. In a fairly radical way. And can we argue that that would really be Islam any longer? That's really the issue. That's really the issue. And it, it's raised in my mind once again by, you know, you, we, you go to Griffiths as a source, but Griffiths is not operating on the idea that, that the Quran is a, is a single authored um, book from one man who dies in 632. It's instead drawing from all sorts of other sources. And once you're willing to start, once you're willing to go there, that's going to change. That's going to change our conversation completely. It's going to change our conversation completely. It really is. Um, and it really makes me wonder how you form your theology once you have the Quran having a very different nature than Islam has always confessed. It's really going to change things. It really is. All right. I could wrap up right there. I could wrap up right there. But we've gone this long. Might as well talk a little bit about what happened yesterday. Um, there were... Yesterday... Um, 
there I had never heard in my entire life of Karen Swallow Pryor until yesterday morning. I've never claimed omniscience. I I do not I am not a Southern Baptist. Um I, I probably have more interaction with Southern Baptists because of my background. I am a Reformed Baptist. I speak in Southern Baptist churches. Um uh, I have lots of Southern Baptist friends. Um but I had never heard of Karen Swallow Pryor. I did not know of any association. I'll be honest with you, other than Dr. Moore, I wouldn't have known anyone at the ERLC. Um, so I'm an outsider. And yesterday, J.D. Hall, pulpit and pen, dropped an article about ERLC and about Karen Swallow Pryor. Well, uh, I didn't see it. Well, I was traveling yesterday. I had to leave Evergreen, Colorado yesterday morning by 3.15 a.m. Uh, to make this really wildly circuitous flight home. I burned airline miles to do this for free. My whole cycling adventure was, you know, yeah, I got to speak up there, but uh, it was training, and I'm going back up there because my big ride's on the 25th. Anyway, uh, I think I really started seeing stuff about it when I got to Seattle. And I was actually charging my Mac up. And they had free Wi-Fi, thankfully, uh, in, in Seattle. And I looked at the article and I thought, wow, um, hmm. Okay, this is interesting. And immediately I started seeing pushback on Twitter, especially from people, you know, from Southern Baptist who said, I know this person and this is not true and that is not true. And, you know, the missiles started flying. At one point, the, um, the from my perspective, most horrific internet meme of all time uh, got introduced and I ended up having some back and forth with a younger gentleman who had presented it and thankfully he withdrew it and so on and so forth so that was what took up some of my time but I just basically said especially when I got home all right I'm hearing both sides going at it on this um, I'm looking forward to the rebuttal articles because if if the if this is imbalanced, if if there's more to the story here, shouldn't be too difficult to for someone to produce a a counter article. Wouldn't seemingly take that much time if this person has if this Karen Swallow Pryor, who is at Liberty, an English teacher at Liberty, um, has written all this stuff shouldn't take much time to respond to this and, and to get this stuff out there. Well, it didn't take long for me to discover that there were a lot of emotions on both sides of this one as well. And I was very disappointed at the fact that a lot of folks just went at it fork and tongue, but it was all just emotions. I'm sitting here trying to go, well, wait, 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 wait. Could someone provide some thoughtful stuff here rather than just I know this person and they're wonderful I think this is just and it's just you know again one of those days where you're going do we really need social media I mean is there anything worthwhile about it at all so eventually I was able to be to find some links and one of the links that was provided by Karen Swallow Pryor herself to me in Twitter was to an article uh, Gay Marriage, Abortion, and the Bigger Picture. All right? This is from Christianity Today. Now, Christianity Today is not my favorite source of anything. 
Uh, but it's under the her menudics. So it's Christian women cultural comment. And this is June 29th, 2015. Not exactly a million years ago. All right. Um, this was presented to me as a, see, this is, this is the kind of thing you need to see that will help you understand exactly where this individual is coming from, who I guess was hired in some capacity, uh, by Dr. Russell Moore at ERLC. Okay. Um, just looking at, well, let me just... Read the beginning. In 1973, the Supreme Court Roe v. Wade and Doe v. Bolton rulings, together legalizing abortion in all 50 states, took everyone by surprise. 42 years later, the court's legalization of gay marriage in Obergefell v. Hodges surprised almost no one. Well, that's true. Both cases mark historic losses for American evangelicals. Minutes after Friday's ruling, Southern Baptist leader Russell Moore called it the Roe v. Wade of marriage. Though many evangelicals oppose abortion and gay marriage as violations of natural law, they are significantly different issues with different social consequences. As, Christ as Christians, we recognize the value of God-given life. When society authorizes the deprivation of life, we commit the gravest possible injustice. The results of abortion are as immediate, visceral, and individual as they are sweeping. An estimated 20% of pregnancies in the U.S. that end in abortion, over 56 million since 1973. The social consequences of legalizing same-sex marriage have yet to be seen. Currently, they comprise less than one-half of 1% 1 of all married couples in the country, and unlike abortion, gay marriage remains an act rooted in love. As Wesley Hill writes, even if we disagree with the expression of homosexuality, we can affirm the longing to be loved and belong. And so I immediately, I didn't stop there, but I, I was immediately caused to stop at that point and go, hmm. Um, that goes on to say, yet what abortion and same-sex marriage have in common is that they each attempt to deny the procreative nature of the sexual union. Each forms a deep crack in the mirror of nature that reflects the image of God. Okay, but I was immediately troubled. And as I read more of the article, I became more troubled. Because um, Dr. Pryor seems to very much embrace... A lot of the terminology that I believe requires a compromise of our position from the very beginning. Um, the acceptance of a community based upon aberrant sexual behavior. I don't how I, I I'm sorry I cannot understand how there is anything called an LGBT community because the L G and the B and the T are all different. Um transsexualism and homosexuality the only thing they seem to have together from a biblical perspective is tremendous confusion and an assertion of absolute human autonomy but bisexualism again very very different from from everything you do there is there's such a such a confusion in that four those four letters that putting them together is like taking magnets that are repelling each other and trying to hold them together. They're just... I, I don't understand how anyone who is thoughtful from a biblical perspective can use the term LGBT community. It's, it's wrong on every level that it can be wrong on, but it's part of just what's, what's the given anymore. You just have to do it to have a place at the table. I don't want a place at that table. If what's being served that table is poisonous. I don't want it. Anyways, the point is this. Um, and unlike abortion, gay marriage remains an act rooted in love. <sighs> the term love, loving, in the Christian context, will always and always has had meaning that the unregenerate person cannot even begin to comprehend. And again, we're talking about how Christians should respond to these issues, how Christians should be speaking. 
there seems to be a fundamental compromise of the Christian worldview by so many today that it's extremely troubling. The millennial generation does not understand the Christian worldview when it comes to the term love. When you're constantly saying, well, you're not being loving, you're not being loving. When that terminology, that phraseology is being used of people who are seeking to be faithful to God's revelation, they are seeking to be loving. And that it is not loving from a Christian perspective to adopt a definition of love that does not have at its very root and its very center the self-sacrificial love that was demonstrated upon the cross of Calvary. But what that requires us is to recognize that true love has to understand that we live in God's world and that sin is destructive of that world and that there's something called the wrath of God against sin. If you don't see that in the cross, you're not seeing the cross. I understand how difficult it is to try to communicate this to a rebel sinner. But I shouldn't have to be communicating this to fellow Christians. I should not have to be reminding fellow Christians that we need to be very careful in our use of that beautiful word, love. And that the last thing we should be doing is utilizing the world's definition of the word love. Gay marriage is not an act rooted in love. How can any Christian say that? How can any thoughtful Christian say that? This requires you to be using the world's definition of love, not the Christian definition of love. Because there is nothing truly loving about profaning the institution given by God to man for the continuation of the species, for the flourishing of human beings, and as a picture of Christ's self-sacrificial love for the church. That is not seen in two men committing themselves to each other for life. As warm and fuzzy as that might be, that is not and can never be biblical marriage because there is no husband and there is no wife. Which is why immediately there are people today trying to get rid of the terminology of husband and wife in law. Because there's no meaning for it anymore in light of the Supreme Court abomination. But the, the point is that mirror image attraction that is a same-sex relationship can never be marriage. And so it's not biblical love. It's not loving to fulfill your own aberrant lusts in that way. And it's not loving for the other person either. It's It involves self-love and then it results in the damaging of the other person. That's not biblical love. I, no matter how you want to try to twist it, you end up having to overthrow the biblical definition of love to make a statement like this. So I get to that point and I go, well, that, that's, you know, I, I'm, I'm very thankful this person is against abortion. But there is a fundamentally compromised worldview involved in this kind of a statement that then continues on the rest of the article as well. So, again, I, I don't, you know, people were basically, I had, there were some people on Twitter basically saying, well, you just need to read everything this person has ever read or has ever written on this subject. I'm sorry, I've got a few other things to be doing. Um, there are actually a few people in this audience that appreciate the fact that I read stuff that you don't want to have to read and then explain it and go on from there. So, but what did concern me 
uh, was this type of this type of language, and I am not making I cannot make a judgment on the accuracy of the pulpit and pen article here, because you know until yesterday I had never heard of this person, but as I started reading through this, then this was it this morning or was it last night? Um, Bob Gagnon also wrote on the Swallow prior issue this morning. But he also wrote on what happened about Julie Rogers at Wheaton, which is very, very directly related to this because if you read an update on the gay debate, evolving ideas, untidy stories, and hopes for the church on julierogers.wordpress.com. She has left Wheaton, but basically, let me here, here, let me just read you two paragraphs. Though I've been slow to admit it to myself, I've quietly supported same-sex relationships for a while now. This is evident while she was still working at Wheaton. When friends have chosen to lay their lives down for their partners, I've celebrated their commitment to one another and supported them as they've lost so many Christian friends they loved. Julie, they are not laying their lives down for someone else. There is the Eitzer Conegdo the correspondence that is necessary to now if you want to if you want to talk about the love that one man can have for another on the battlefield in laying your life down for someone else that's one thing that's never ever been marriage and it will never be marriage it's a great form of love it's wonderful but it's not marriage it's not a picture of christ in the church it's not an eights or connecto. It does not produce life. It may save one life by sacrificing another. Totally different context. Totally different context. Um, when young people have angst at me about the gay debate, I've just told them to follow Jesus, to seek to honor him with their sexuality and love others well. That wasn't Jesus' answer. That wasn't Jesus' answer. Jesus does not leave you to angst. He addressed God's creative purpose. Matthew 19. For some, I imagine they will feel led to commit to lifelong celibacy. For others, I think it will mean laying their lives down for spouses and staying true to that promise to the end. You mean giving in. You mean capitulating. You mean going against Jesus' teaching. Just be honest. See, this is... There's going to be so much of this language so carefully crafted to avoid following Jesus' clear teachings. There is no clear teaching. That's the whole point here. My main hope for all of them is that they would grow to love Jesus more and that it would overflow into a life spent on others. You see, that sounds so wonderful to the millennial generation, but it doesn't have any meaning. Because you don't love Jesus if you disobey him. You don't love Je Jesus said something about if you love me, you will what's the term? Keep my commandments. While I struggle to understand how to apply scripture to the marriage debate today, why? Why? It's not because of a lack of clarity in the scripture. It's because of a lack of commitment on your part to the Lordship of Christ. It's this gay marriage, commitment of love. Here, Julie Rogers, somebody else. We are, we are going to be buried in this. We are going to be swimming in it. And if you don't have the solid foundation under your feet, you're going to drown. This is the language of our culture. 
but our culture has stopped honoring language. That's the problem. That's the problem. There's so much more, but I've already... The smell in the studio from the completely destroyed clutch of the program is almost overwhelming. I'm, I'm starting, starting to tear up. Really am. We have gone so far with so many topics today. But we sort of came around, actually, we sort of tied stuff together at the end, didn't we? Because Matthew Vines has been willing to redefine language. And Julie Rogers is redefining language. Now, he's doing it purposefully and knowledgeably. She just may be very, very confused. I don't know. I don't know. All I'm saying is, folks, you've got to listen to what is being said. Analyze presuppositionally. And stay committed to the fact that God has spoken. And he's spoken with clarity. And we try to help you work with those issues. You're on the dividing line. And that's what we're doing. We'll be back again on Thursday. I don't know what we'll be talking about. Because between now and then, who knows what may happen. But we almost went a full, you know, nine minutes short of a full mega. We'll call it a mega anyways. Uh, a mega edition of The Dividing Line. And who knows, next, maybe the next time we'll actually have just one topic. Then again, maybe not. We'll see. We'll see you then. Thanks for watching. God bless.